Hello, everyone. Welcome to this editor series broadcast, Strategies for Designing Adaptable, Resilient Biopharma Facilities. I'm Rita Peters, Editorial Director of Pharmaceutical Technology, and I'll be moderating this event along with Jennifer Markarian, the Manufacturing Editor of Pharmaceutical Technology. Biopharma facilities, processes, and procedures are designed to protect the product and people. The COVID-19 pandemic requires biopharma companies to look beyond good manufacturing practices to assess how the potential spread of the virus may impact different areas of development and manufacturing facilities, the employees, visitors, and product. In this webcast, we're gonna look at strategies for evaluating practices at existing facilities and discuss options for designing new facilities that can accommodate future needs, including flexible, flexible excuse me, flexibility requirements and any emerging threats. This webcast is presented by Pharmaceutical Technology and Biopharm International in conjunction with Interfex. Interfex is the premier pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and device development and manufacturing event to experience science through commercialization, through exhibits, networking, and conferences to leverage quality, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. Interfex will take place April 20th to the 22nd, 2021 in New York. I have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit your question by typing it in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window or you can hover your mouse over the lower right-hand lower right corner and drag the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, just click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. This editor series event is supported by three sponsors. Contact Inc. is an ISO 9001-2015 registered company dedicated to producing quality contamination control products for critical cleaning environments worldwide. The extensive product line includes sterile and non-sterile knitted, non-woven, and pre-saturated wipes, mopping systems, bucket systems, as well as solutions and disinfectants. Visit www.contactinc.com to learn more. Pharma Solutions, a platform within DuPont, uses more than 300 years of experience in cellulosic to solve challenges, beyond, challenges across dosage forms. DuPont draws from the experience of historically market-leading excipient companies who pioneered brands like Avacel and Methacel. With that unique portfolio and its continuous focus manufacturing, quality and regulatory expertise, DuPont can help deliver consistent, high-quality offerings for pharma customers. Visit pharma.dupont.com for more. ILC Dover is a world leader in the innovative design and production of engineered flexible protective solutions. Based in Frederica, Delaware, the company serves, as the, pharma serves the pharmaceutical industry with single-use flexible powder solutions that facilitates safe and reliable performance and productivity in the lab. CMOs and CDMOs choose ILC Dover solutions for powder transfers and containment over rigid stainless steel systems for the significant advantages they bring to chemical synthesis of highly potent APIs and oral solid dosage processing for final drug products. You can learn more about our sponsors by checking the resources, resources section of your viewer. We thank them for their support. Now I'd like to welcome today's speakers. Kurt Feierstein is a mechanical engineer for CRB with 30 years of overall engineering experience, including a focus on the pharmaceutical and biotechnology market for the past 20 years. Over the last couple of years, he's been involved with several of CRB's cell and gene therapy product, projects. Kurt's specific experience includes HVAC design of clean rooms and support areas, 
utility systems serving the HVAC and process equipment for clean rooms, including utility plants for cooling and heating systems, in addition to developing CGMP area classification, AHU zoning and pressurization plans. He's been involved in engineering and design of laboratories, pharmaceutical manufacturing suites, filling suites, central chiller and boiler utility plants, facility waste management neutralization systems. In addition, Kurt has over five years of experience directly involved with commissioning of HVAC and control systems and equipment that serves pharmaceutical facilities. Jason Collins, Director of Process Architecture at IPS, is a premier process architect who develops master plans and concept designs for pharmaceutical facilities around the world. Jason focuses on advanced aseptic facility design and uses unique visualization techniques to assist clients in the development of unit operations and conceptual layouts. He has conceptualized and led the final design and construction services for numerous cutting edge biopharmaceutical facilities around the world. Jason has over 20 years of experience in conceptual and detailed architectural design, as well as construction related services. As director of process architecture, his focus is on designing fully integrated facilities that support manufacturing and operational processes. His capabilities include project scope development, programming, conceptual design, material and personnel flow development, material and system evaluation, detailed design and construction administration. His designs have led to innovative, world-class facilities that not only produce product, but can also be maintained and operated efficiently and safely. So welcome both Kurt and Jason. We appreciate your being here. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Markarian, our manufacturing editor, who will introduce the rest of the program. Thank you, Rita. Before our presentation, I would like to invite our audience to participate in a polling question. Please click directly on the screen to enter your answers. Here's the first question. What do you see as your biggest facility and operations challenge? Keeping my workers safe and healthy, maintaining my operations output or having enough capacity, having enough raw materials and other supplies, maintaining regulatory compliance, or all of the above? I'll read that one more time while um, you have a chance to answer. Again, it, the choices are keeping my workers safe and healthy, maintaining my operations output, having enough capacity, having enough raw materials and other supplies, maintaining regulatory compliance, or all of the above. So we will, um, in just a minute here, we'll show our the results of our poll question. Okay, so the results of the question, um, almost half say all of the above. Um, we've got a, a lot of a lot of issues and all interconnected. And then there are a few um, kind of evenly divided that that uh, would choose one of those other four, one of the four as specifically their biggest challenge. Uh, Kurt or Jason, do you have any comments on on those results from from what you see? I think they're in line from my perspective for some of our clients and what we've seen our clients comments issues. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would agree with that. It is quite consistent. I was surprised to hear how many uh folks are um struggling with raw materials, especially those coming from Asia and other locations. Um but really I think this is reflective of, of the state of the industry today. Okay. Thank you. So let me now turn the presentation over to Kurt, who is going to discuss process and workflow considerations for existing facilities. Kurt? Thank you, Jennifer. And I want to thank everyone with uh, Pharmaceutical Technology and all the sponsors for today's webinar. Agenda here. I want to just briefly run through uh, some risks to existing facilities and what those possible changes are to the suggestions. Uh, Rita did a good job of uh, giving an overview of my experience, so we'll skip through this slide. But uh, I've got uh, quite a bunch of years of experience and 20 years in pharmaceutical. Doing this for quite a long time. 
Hey, Kurt, this is Rita. Could 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 you could you speak up a little bit? Sure. Sure. Um, so what are these risks to the existing facilities? Is that a little better? Do I need to talk louder? Yeah, yeah that, that's good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just double checking. Sorry about that. So potential HVAC risks to facilities. Uh, we wanted to start with looking at uh, different aspects from an HVAC perspective. The number of people in your manufacturing areas are typically your, your big problem. Why? Because personnel inside a clean room, uh, they tend to be the, the dirtiest thing inside a clean room. It happens due to particulates that are generated from those folks. And uh, we're really concerned about that in lower grade clean rooms where maybe there's less levels of gowning than you typically see in a higher grade clean room. Concerned about those in your CNC and grade D type environments. and uh, we also are concerned about the number of people inside those manufacturing areas. How close together are they working? Um, and what what can we do to make that? And the level of gowning. Uh, don't have much gowning, they're going to generate a lot more particulate. Um, with respect to, to those lower grade clean rooms too, they may not be cleaned as highly uh, and frequently as you would see from say, a grade C or higher clean and uh, help you get the Kurt, Kurt, we're we're losing you again. Um, maybe you can bring the microphone a little closer to you. Sure, sure. I'm trying. Um, I'll speak a little louder. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So now we want to focus on uh, some of the HVAC risks inside the clean rooms and. Uh, for typical grade D, C and C and unclassified spaces, there are lower air change rates inside those, those facilities. And those lo lower air change rates uh, mean that you're gonna have higher quantities of particulate possibly hanging out in the space and, uh, and floating around for a longer period of time. In those same classified spaces, they typically have ceiling returns and ceiling exhaust. So your supply is coming from up high and your return and exhaust is going out the same level. So you've got a lot of turbulent mixing going on inside the uh, clean room. And that coupled with lower levels of gowning, you've got more particulate being generated. So that hangs up inside your clean room uh, for quite a bit of time. So any type of virus that might be airborne is going to be floating around inside your clean room for, for some time. Um, in addition, these types of facilities with the lower grades don't have much outside air. Now, why is that important? Uh, any outside air coming in to, through your HVAC system is helping you to flush those rooms out and, and kind of turn over the air inside that space. So we want to make sure that, uh, that you're turning over that air and those systems have less level of filtration. So their, their filters in the air handling units might be a MERV-8 or uh, somewhere maybe a little bit higher than MERV-8, which not going to give you a good level of filtration for your HVAC system. So those are definite risks that you want to consider. But I think importantly here is the support spaces. These support spaces may have VAV systems. Now what's a VAV system? That's variable air volume control for your air handling unit. And what that means is that they tend to back down on the airflow as the load in the space decreases, or if you go into winter mode operation, they back down to a minimum heating level. And that minimum heating level is probably 50% of your cooling level uh, of airflow. So your, your airflow drops to basically half of what you have for cooling. So you're doing less air change rate for the heating. And that is in winter when the viral spread tends to be worse. So that's a a definite risk that you need to consider with support spaces. So now what are some of the process risks that we deal with in, in, or are looking at in some facilities? The number of personnel inside the manufacturing area, again, could be a risk. And in this time, in this environment, we may be dealing with less staff inside a clean room, but in some areas, maybe it's more congested, and that could be a real big concern from a risk of an environmental standpoint. Uh, for, for any kind of virus floating around. So we need to, we need to find uh, ways we can deal with that aspect and that risk. Um, with the lower number of people inside your clean room, um, you may have problems getting materials from your warehouse 
over to your clean room area for processing, and you need to definitely look into how can we staff that from a standpoint of your process with a lower number of people. Um, cleaning frequency and utilization, equipment utilization, is something that we need to look into and make sure that the equipment is utilized to the fullest extent while you're processing. And lower staff, your utilization might be really low. So these are definite risks to your operation. And material and waste flow through your facility, another, another item we want to make sure we're looking at. So all of these risks need to be considered. We can understand how do we want to change the potential, uh, how do you want to change the facility to improve things? So one thing that we want to start with with HVAC is for lower grade clean rooms, I think we need to consider increasing air change rates possibly and see if you could at least increase your supply airflow to those lower grade spaces, including your support spaces, so that way we can get more airflow and more changes, more turnover of anything in those spaces. But this has a big infrastructure component to it, which means that your HVAC equipment, your ductwork, and, and layout could be impacted by all of those aspects. Um, that needs to be investigated when you're looking at different options for upgrading, because uh, it just may not be just turn the switch to, to a higher level of airflow and done. Um, the other thing that we want to look into as an option for an upgrade would be low wall exhaust or low wall returns for your uh, specific areas. Again, we're looking at grade D, uh, grade C and C, or unclassified spaces. Don't have that. And if we could possibly put low walls in and still have supply overhead, we may be better sweeping the room and getting particulate out. In addition, I'm, I'm sure everybody's thinking about this already, which is gowning level. Uh, we want to increase gowning level and, and have the workers wear face masks where possible. Now, CRB looks at these different options through one of the tools called CFD analysis. What is CFD? CFD is computational fluid dynamics, and one of the programs we use is a program called ANSYS Fluid. What does all that mean? Well, really, it's a piece of software that takes basic fluid flow calculations, breaks them down into small, finite steps, make it easier to manage and, and more predictable on how to do those calculations. So with that software, we can evaluate airflow patterns in existing facilities to see how they are, are running and if you've got a lot of turbulence and particulate hanging out in your space or if you're able to get the sweeping motion like we'd like to have in uh, other rooms. And so using CFD, we could take that model of an existing uh, clean room operation that's inefficient and optimize that and, and get a much better flow for that room, particularly over where the operators are. And maybe that involves some upgrades down the road of moving supplies around. But using CFD, it can tell us and help us make that decision to, be, to improve those operations and their flow. And that's better than trial and error, because if you're doing a trial and error in the field, it's costing you time, money, and dollars to do renovations for, for not knowing what the outcome is. That you want to basically make sure you avoid. Some of the examples of CFD that we get from an, from an output standpoint uh, are the graphics that are shown on the screen right now. In the upper left-hand side, it's called a heat map for the room. What that heat map has done for an evaluation we did for a clean room, it shows where there's very stagnant airflow by having red or yellow areas that show up on the heat map um, that indicate that there's stagnant airflow going on there and poor airflow, poor circulation there. So that might be where particulate would, would gather or drop out, have problems sweeping the room. Viruses could end up being there or you could have particles in. On the bottom right-hand side, uh, it's, it's airflow lines that we did a simplified model just to show what's called a spaghetti map of how that airflow goes from your supply air HEPAs in the ceiling down to your low wall returns uh, around the perimeter of the room. And we, we call it simplified because you can kind of see this, the lines of how the airflow goes from supply through returns. Some of those lines get quite long, and that means where it's hanging up inside the room and inside the facility 
where your problems and trouble areas could be. So the next slide is a very quick video showing the same, same exact uh, simulation. It, it's a short video, but it shows the supply coming from the ceiling going down to your low walls. Go back and go forward one more time. And this video just really shows you how you're sweeping and flushing the room when you have low wall returns. So from that was HVAC uh, tools that we use. The next tool we utilize is process simulation to, to help your facility out. Process simulation really boiled down to is another piece of software that utilizes discrete event simulation whereby each individual event can be uniquely defined and with its own parameters and variables to determine how it impacts your process and your operations of your facility. So with, CF, with process simulation, using a program called FlexSim, we can evaluate if you need to stagger shifts from a production standpoint to improve your, your output or your production capabilities, or you can evaluate what staffing reductions may do in a, like the current environment where you may not have enough folks on hand to, to operate your facility, and what does that do from your output standpoint. In some instances, with process simulation, you can determine like with CFD, you can determine ways to, to make decisions to improve that function and functionality to keep production up. Another thing the process simulation will do is help you look at your resources and your mater raw material flow in process and operations. See what those impacts are if you don't have enough materials or you're running uh, short on supplies. Just like in CFD and for process simulation, with FlexSim, we have different outputs we get from, from those models. Upper left-hand corner is showing a graphic that indicates your head count that you would need for your operations. For, in this case, this is a weight dispense operation and where the peak involves. And the other area on the upper right-hand side is utilization of your equipment, which we can see that there's a good bit of time that it's not being utilized or it's waiting for an operator to that piece of equipment. So it's sitting there idle for a decent amount of time. So process simulation may point out these things. Maybe facility operators know already, but uh, are not fully aware of. And the bottom graphic is showing your, how your uh, sequencing of your and your scheduling of that equipment comes into play with your output, which is how much you're getting out of your yields, out of your processing, whether it's a bioreactor in this case that we're looking at for where you need through your production. And that really, you know, what we want to do is look at these things to see um, how do we help our, maybe our, our staffing right now that, it, that it's limited, uh, make sure we can keep our production up or at least at an optimal level um, so it's not dramatically impacted. But I think one good thing that I'm hearing from clients out there is that they are all willing to accept the fact that, that they know their production levels could be hammered right now and, and be a little less than what they were before the outbreak started but they're willing to accept that fact to make sure that our empl their employees are safe and operate those facilities in a safe manner. This next slide shows how process simulation will, will look at layouts and determine where you've got some hot spots in those layouts. Um, similar to CFD, this will give you a yellow and a red uh, indication like on the upper left-hand side of the slide uh, that shows you've got from your warehouse operations on the right going over to your production facilities and moving materials around inside your facility, we've got a hallway that's, that's pretty heavily used and, and where you've got impacts with that, uh, with that area. So those, those graphics kind of give you a, a good illustration of where those yellow and red spots are and determine how we want to schedule those flows and, and move them more efficiently around the facility. This slide here is a graphic that shows how people are, are operating inside their QC lab and, and what the utilization is for that equipment inside the lab. The pie chart on the upper right-hand side is showing you the utilization of the equipment. By pretty quickly, let me replay that one more time. But with that pie chart, I wanted to indicate that that equipment's only being utilized 25% of the time. So is there a way we can help from a production standpoint, prove that, and 
make sure that our workers that are operating the, that equipment are safely distanced. Because in that video, you can see they were pretty close together at times. So with that said, how do we manage this current situation? I think there's some tools that can help us evaluate how we want to, to navigate the, the current environment. CFD analysis is going to help us from an HVAC perspective to determine in high-risk areas like your unclassified spaces how to make changes to those infrastructure and operations to help you. And process simulation can also help with staffing and determining how you can keep your operations performing at its optimal rate and, and uh, moving your personnel and material flows around in an optimum fashion. Those are the two main tools we use to help us figure that out. And questions, we'll, we'll save those for the end, but I want to turn it back to Jennifer. Yes. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was a very interesting presentation. I appreciate that. And now I'd like to ask our audience to participate in our second polling question. So again, please click directly on the screen to enter your answers. The question is, which of the following are concerns for the next six months for your pharma operations? Uh, in this one, you can please check all that apply. Disruptions in supply of raw materials, disruptions in supply or in qualification of equipment, facility maintenance or operations problems, illness or unavailability of employees, or shortage of investment capital for innovation. Um, so again, I'll um, I'll read those and give you give you a chance to um, to reply. The concerns for the next six months for your pharma operations. The choices that you can choose are disruptions in supply of raw materials, disruptions in supply or qualification of equipment, facility maintenance or operations problems, illness or unavailability of employees, or shortage of capital for innovation. Okay, now we'll take a look at the answers to those questions. And um, we're pretty evenly split, although I guess the the uh, the most chosen answer was illness or unavailability of employees. Um, you know, big unknown out there, but that is seems to be the concern uh, for for a good number of people here. Jason or Kurt, do you have any uh, thoughts on those? I'd say it's pretty telling and, and, you know, I think it's revealing and I think throughout many uh, industries and, and businesses, availability of employees is certainly going to be a major factor moving forward and, and keeping them safe. So good information from this poll. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. All right. Thank I, you. I agree, Jason. And uh, I would I'm curious about the supply of raw materials too. I would have thought that would be a big concern. Mm. Lower. Okay, good. So let me now turn the presentation over to Jason, who is going to discuss some considerations for future facility designs. Great, thank you very much. So recently we had developed a design for the aseptic facility of the future. And because so many of the features are based on flexibility and adaptation, I thought it would be relevant for this webinar based on the pandemic situation we find ourselves in and what many folks in the industry are facing as they try to modify their facilities and get them ready to produce vaccines, um, and many with a process that's still yet unknown. So when we set out to design the aseptic facility of the future, uh, we simply started by asking ourselves a simple question of, you know, what, what should the requirement of the facility of the future be? And the answer that we came up with was also simple. Facility of the future should address the many challenges and issues that facilities are dealing with today. And if you think about this situation and what's going on in the industry right now, the need for flexibility and the ability to, you know, change course and redirect um, capabilities for, you know, the world need of, of a vaccine is very much in line with this approach. And so some of the aspects of the facility that I want to talk about today, there isn't really enough time to go through all of them, but I wanted to focus on what's relevant today. Uh, some of these points I think are, are um, quite telling. So today's facilities are not flexible, often designed for a specific purpose, not easily adapted to new technologies or processes. 
They cannot, cannot react quickly to business drivers, new products, and capacity requirements. Production suites are not easily segregated, so improvements can be made. They have poor maintenance access. Future phasing and expansion is not well considered. And they take too long to build with high initial cost requirements. So let's see if we could try to address some of these issues in a single facility design. I'll give a very brief overview. It's a three-story facility. The first floor is, is um, reserved for critical utilities, the material handling, support, and office space. The second floor is uh, focused on manufacturing. This is where all the clean rooms would occur, as well as some support areas. And the third floor is maintained entirely for the plant room. So all the mechanical systems and other uh, service items are reserved for the third floor. I'm not planning to go in detail through the layouts because in all honesty, the layouts are irrelevant because we're designing a facility that's flexible uh, and that could be uh, changed and accommodate whatever process you might need to put inside. And that'll be more apparent as we go on. But some of the things I do wanna focus on is we chose a three-story layout for a reason, especially for sterile manufacturing facilities. We believe this is the ideal section for a facility. So we're looking at a section through the facility as if you were to cut it in half and look inside. And so we have, as I mentioned, the plant utilities and process utilities, um, material handling and support are on that ground floor, the first level. And you can almost make out some of the equipment you're seeing an isolated filling line on the second level. And that's really what that is. So the second level is production manufacturing with a full interstitial space and walkable ceiling uh, for maintenance and ductwork distribution. And then we have our full mechanical room on that third level with our HVAC systems. Some of the reasons why this is an optimal arrangement is because the critical utilities can be directly below the systems they support. Drainage from the production areas does not need to be underground. So if you think about your drainage coming from the elevated slab above, it's a lot easier to do some rework and adjustments for your drainage rather than dealing with trenches or underground drainage. Items not required in the clean room can be located elsewhere. If you think about the single, single biggest investment in your facility, it's the clean room areas, right? They have the highest cost per square foot and the most expensive equipment in them. So if we could remove equipment that's not needed in the clean room and put them elsewhere, such as temperature control modules or other support equipment, heat exchangers, that sort of thing, if you could put them on the floor below or the floor above, we can reduce the size of those clean rooms and reduce the cost of our facility. For this arrangement, we have a fully accessible interstitial space, which can be accessed via a stair or an elevator. And we have all of the HVAC systems directly above the rooms they support. By having that full plant room, we can minimize ductwork um, lengths and place the units directly over the spaces that they're serving. So one of the first challenges I mentioned was that uh, facilities are not flexible or able to adapt to new technologies or processes. So let's talk about new technologies or processes. And and I think for aseptic facilities, we're definitely talking about isolators. And isolators are not new. They were um, fairly new in this country in the early 90s uh, and um, even advanced a little earlier in Europe. Um, so isolators are not new, but the where, where isolators are trending is. But the reason why we choose isolator technology is because of this guy, right? I think Curtis touched on this. The single greatest source of risk in aseptic processing is personnel-related contamination. We want to keep pig pen away from our products. And isolators provide the, the best capability for doing that because they truly provide a barrier between people and our, the products that we're making. But where isolators are going today is um, much smaller systems. We're seeing modular, multi-format, flexible filling lines. We're seeing much smaller systems that are completely contained within the clean room environment. We're seeing the integra integration of robots. And with the smaller systems, we're also seeing shorter delivery times. These are some examples of those systems. And as I mentioned, they're uh, sort of a plug and play approach. Um, 
Many of them consist of stationary isolators with a trolley system where you can move in and out different production capabilities, thereby being able to fill vials one day and syringes the next. Hopefully this movie will play. And there it goes. And you can see the stationary isolator on the left, and she's moving one of those trolleys out of the isolator. So you can think about this trolley being dedicated for vials and maybe another one for syringes, and you can switch them out day to day and have the flexibility for different kinds of products or different kinds of product containers. So here's a view inside our 3D model of the facility, and you can see some of those offerings that we were talking about. All the way on the left is the FlexPro um, system, which is uh, the filling system is made by Groninger and the isolators by Zeal. And then the Variosys systems, which are the central line and the one all the way to the right, the filling systems are made by um, Bausch and Strobel and the isolators by SCAN. And with these different systems, you can have a, very, a, a, um, a variable uh, types of filling systems and capabilities to do either pre-sterilized components or bulk components or a combination of, of the two. As I had mentioned, what you're seeing on the screen is, is pretty much the entire system as well. So with um, the addition of some control cabinets, which of course come with the equipment, you can see how all of the systems fit within a 10-foot um, room or three-meter room uh, without separate air handlers elsewhere or any other additional uh, support system. So what, what you see can be moved in through corridors and easily changed out, either during initial construction or in the future. So the next item regarding facilities was that they could not be quickly, um, they could not quickly react to business drivers, new products, and capacity requirements. So how do we make our facilities more flexible to adapt to the changing environment? pharmaceutical environment. So one thought is to get the facility out of the way. So what does that mean? In this particular facility, in the heart of the facility, in the production areas, we created a space which we call the no structure zone. It's basically 20 feet high by over 100 feet long by almost the total width of the building where there are no structural components, no columns, no cross bracing, nothing to get in the way of the ideal manufacturing layout or environment. And we do this utilizing long span structural systems so that we can maximize the amount of open space in the facility. So if we take a look at our plan and we highlight that area, you could see the entire clean room environment is completely open. There are no columns in there at all. And this allows us to optimize room sizes and have the ideal layout drive the facility design, not the requirements of the structural systems and we're not limited by the location of columns or, or any other fixed items structurally. Another added benefit as we have been applying this on mul multiple projects is it also allows us to really drive down the footprint of the facility, which I had mentioned earlier. And you'd be amazed how much smaller facilities can become if you're not worried about where columns are and, and how they affect the, the equipment arrangements. Um, you, you probably re recall a facility where there's a column right next to a piece of equipment that either makes it difficult for you to access the equipment or you had to change the, um, the equipment after it arrived because of the structural systems. So this provides us with a tremendous amount of flexibility and freedom. Now with that open space, it all also allows us to reconfigure the facility as required in the future. And let's say this was your initial facility and it's based on having three production suites, sterile manufacturing suites. Each one of these happen to have two formulation rooms. And all the way on the left, where the magenta areas are, that's our component prep or washing and sterilization. And let's say we were developing a number of different products with this facility, and we were filling vials and syringes and ampules, lyophilized products, liquid products, and all of a sudden we found ourselves within a pandemic, and we wanted to do something about it. We could think about the utilization of this facility and we could think, well, if we use the filling line all the way on the left and start to use that line to do clinical trials and development of a new vaccine 
And while that's going on, we retrofit the rest of the facility for commercial manufacturing lines. So once we do have an approved product, we could make the capacity needed. We can think about what that might look like. So if we highlight these two lines and we retrofit them, you know, it's quite easy to adapt this facility to having a high-speed filling line uh, with two IOs, you know, very high capacity, and you've transformed your flexible, small-volume, innovative facility to a high-output facility uh, quite easily. And because it is a three-story facility, we can take advantage of things like vertically integrated LIOs and place all the LIO equipment like the condensers and the refrigeration skids directly below in that um, critical utility space we have reserved below. So flexible not only on the floor plate, but in the vertical as well. So of course, you might be asking, how do we do that while maintaining ongoing operations? And while there have been um, many designs which precede this one where we try to locate removable panels on exterior walls and try to preposition, it's often difficult to know exactly where you're going to do your renovations. And so we tried to think outside of the box a little bit and come up with a different solution. And so we, we explored the system of removable floors, which might sound interesting. And basically where these red dashed lines are on the top and the bottom of the manufacturing areas are sections of flooring which can be removed in the future. Now it's not push the button and the, and the floor pops out, but they, they can be removed relatively easily and in line with normal um, construction readiness. So if you follow where those rectangles are located and we go down to the floor below, you'll see on the first level where those rectangles are are just outside of our critical utility space, which is in the middle of the building, and where we have some, some storage and some racking uh, and um, pallet staging locations. So if we put ourselves within that corridor, and you can see the racking and those, um, the pallet positions there. If we think about removing the racking, we can remove those sections of flooring, install a scaffold stair and a material lift, and we can be doing a large portion of our construction from directly below instead of crossing classified spaces and trying to work within weekends only or shutdowns. So how would that work? First thing you do, Oops, went, went a little quick there, is install the construction barriers. Next, we would remove the section of floor. Now, you don't have to remove all of it. It could just be portions of the flooring like you see with the red box there. From there, we add in our stair and our, our lift, and we can do all of our construction right through that zone. Now, for this facility, we made sure we sized those spaces so that we could bring up and down some of the larger pieces of equipment, which I mentioned are, you know, smaller and modular. Of course, you might have to bring in some larger equipment from the outside wall, but the majority of the construction can be done basically by going up and down from these areas. Next, we talk about they have poor maintenance access. And here again, the three-story facility lends itself to this approach. We have a full um, critical utility area with easy access and easy maintenance on the, on the first level. We have the walkable ceiling, as I mentioned, with access from the elevator or stair. And we have our full plan room, so you don't have air handlers buried in back corners of the building. There's plenty of space for maintenance and access. And if we look at the floor plans, you can see there are also aisles that are pre-planned for both the ground floor and the third floor uh, with easy access from roll-up doors and, and uh, large aisleways, so you can pull out a whole air handling unit section or pull a coil. And the same thing for utilities, it's easy to bring uh, future utilities in should you need to. Next, future phasing and expansion. So I talked a little bit about the structure, and the structure is based on a, a module, a module of 30 feet. So those column lines running north-south on this drawing actually are 30 feet apart. And we chose 30 feet because it's a very efficient length from a structural standpoint, but it also aligns with modular clean room panel systems, which are often based on a 10-foot module. So from that standpoint, there is a modular aspect to the building. And if this isn't the initial scope that's required, um, you can think about future expansion by adding 
additional structural bays and potentially another manufacturing suite. So you can design based on what's needed today and expand in the future. And you can even imagine the minimal uh, construction, which is these five bays, where you get everything you need for manufacturing, component prep, formulation, filling, locker rooms, um, support for warehousing below, critical utilities, office space, all within that initial build and right-sized initially. And here again is the beauty of the three-story facility, because as you imagine uh, extending your, your facility with growth, it's really an extrusion, whereas manufacturing expands on the second level, you can also expand your utilities and HVAC systems in kind. So you can decide how much infrastructure you want to put in initially, but also have the flexibility to add it as you move forward because you get those additional spaces when you expand. Next, we want to address the length it takes to build buildings and, and how much it costs. Oftentimes, however, for sterile manufacturing facilities, the facility is not often the critical path uh, for delivering uh, product or medicines, right? Usually it's the equipment. Um, High-speed filling lines, uh, commercial-scale filling lines, we're seeing anywhere from 18 to 24 months from order to delivery, uh, which is not restrictive when it comes to building the facility, which can be built um, quite a bit quicker. However, as I mentioned, with the new smaller systems, we are seeing shorter lead times, uh, maybe 10 months to a year. And so based on that, we might want to look at different uh, delivery methods for our facility. So what we did was we went and we challenged the pre-engineered building manufacturers, and we asked them if using their kit of parts, whether they could come up with a facility that meets the requirements for the pharmaceutical industry. If you're not familiar with pre-engineered buildings, these are the kinds of buildings that are often used for skating rinks or indoor tennis courts. Um, they have a very simple structure with a large open span, um, lots of flexibility. However, they can't often um, support the loads that we see in the manufacturing facilities for the pharmaceutical industry. You know, it's more than just keeping the weather out. We have a lot of things that need to be supported from that structure. So we asked them if they could build a three-story facility using their kit of parts that could handle the requirements we're looking for. And if I highlight the structure of the facility in red, as you see here, those are actually the common structural elements that we often see in pre-manufactured buildings. It's uh, some of the telltale signs of those tapered beams and columns um, with the large profiles and the long spans. And they actually created the structural system for us to include in the model, which gives that, us that 100-foot long foot span or, or long span, as well as the three stories we were looking for with the ability to support the loads we're looking for as well. So potentially using the pre-engineered approach can save us some time, and we're also using known systems. We have a predetermined cost uh, right off the bat as well, so some benefits there. So, you know, in a nutshell, those are some of the principles from this facility of the future. Um, you could probably tell by the, the, um, the photovoltaic cells on the roof that, that there all, are also aspects of sustainability and other elements that have been designed to this building. Um, however, I think those are really the, the areas we wanted to focus with the, the time we have for this webinar. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I will turn it over to Rita. Well, thank you very much, Jason, and thank you, Curtis, also for your, your presentations. Um, the, our experts have had a couple conversations with the editors uh, in this area, so we've got a few questions we want to put out to them right now. Right. Uh, so uh, first, uh, how would you describe the level of preparedness of the industry from a facility or operation standpoint to, to manufacture op optimally in the coming months? Uh, Kurt, let's hear from you first. Sure. I think with, with this uh, question, it's probably uh, – I, I think the industry is probably already looking into how can we be prepared for, for what we're dealing with from a material standpoint, like stocking up on gowning and probably getting things that they haven't thought of before, masks and things like that. But uh, I, I think looking uh, at it currently, they must be evaluating physical distances between the operators where they've got close operations in process and manufacturing areas. 
and, and seeing what we could do there. And in some cases, maybe they're buying, you know, wall panels. And those wall panels would, would kind of separate the operators and give them distancing between closed spaces as a temporary interim solution. Um, and probably investigating cleaning procedures, looking back to how they're cleaning the areas now and increasing cleaning frequency. They want to look at different um, cleaning chemicals that they want to use. Um, everything may be okay with what they're using, and they just increasing frequency. Um, I think those are definitely considerations they'd have to con have to look into. I think Jason, you have some thoughts. Sure, I'll take that question from a different aspect of getting ready for uh, manufacturing the new vaccines when they're ready. And I think there's a number of ways we can look at this, and there's a number of ways that the industry is indeed looking at this. And so there's a combination of building new facilities in anticipation of the requirements for the new vaccines, and we are seeing that happening. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's a, a race and a coordination with getting the equipment as well as understanding the, the actual process that's going to be required for um, this vaccine in, in particular. And then there's other capabilities as well. If you think about the worldwide vaccine capabilities we have right now, there's quite a bit of, of capability. The challenge is, you know, how do you stop producing those vaccines and, and other medications that people need and repurpose those areas for the production of the new vaccine? And so I believe folks are looking at different ways of either ramping up production now and stockpiling so that they can be prepared once the vaccine is developed um, and other methods as well. Uh, one of the challenges will be that I believe the CDC is, is um, stating that COVID-19, um, the, the virus itself, when it's in a uh, concentrated format uh, and even during things like cell culture, that it requires a BSL-3 background or design uh, or facility, uh, really. And so, you know, that'll be a challenge. There aren't a lot of BSL-3 facilities around, so the adaptation of facilities to be able to accommodate that is something that will be required. But hopefully the drug product production, you know, down, down the road a bit of actually making the vaccine will be less than that, uh, depending on what kind of vaccine it truly is. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, let's come on to our next question. So what do you see as the top new facility or equipment technologies that manufacturers should, should implement? Uh, you know, things that are available now or are being used by early adopters or perhaps used in other industries? Kurt, we'll start with you again. Sure. Uh, I think new equipment, uh, I think initially they're going to be looking at any kind of Clean room, uh, say you know, like wall, like window panel systems that they could implement in between operators again to try and separate them in close areas. Uh, that would be my assumption right there for trying to. Um, I think careful planning and logistics needs to be considered for how any uh, uh, modifications to operations can be applied to keep people separate and segregated. Those are things that equipment vendors would have to look into their equipment, right where the operators. Jason, any thoughts on this? Um, sure. I think um, from again from a manufacturing standpoint, you know, many of the flexible manufacturing systems we were talking about in the presentation are certainly relevant for this kind of um, vaccine production. I think there's also going to be a call to manufacturers and, and equipment technology specialists to um, not only figure out better ways of manufacturing, but better ways of testing and verifying the safety and efficacy of products in a way that can be turned around quickly. I think uh, we're seeing that not only for the vaccine production, but for other um, treatment type um, uh, therapeutic uh, items where, you know, there isn't a lot of material and doing destructive testing uh, not only jeopardizes the, the amount of product, but also the time it takes to wait for things to come back from the lab uh, can be detrimental. So I think, you know, looking to uh, technologists to develop ways of scanning and verifying products almost immediately and, and in real time would be a tremendous benefit to the industry. 
All right. Um, thanks. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to jump over uh, to some questions from the audience. So just a quick reminder, if you have a question for our speakers, you can submit it uh, in the Q&A box, which is located on the right-hand side of your presentation window. Um, so uh, first one, um, would it be safe to say that due to the potential reduction in personnel, there will be a greater need for instruments that can provide data or diagnostics, allowing fewer operators to uh, utilize better data to maximize production time? So I can take that one. I, I've had that discussion with some clients where they're saying they, they feel like they would need additional automation and instrumentation in order to keep their production uh, going at, at a higher level. Um, if, if we're operating with reduced staff, um, there may be ways that we can automate other parts of the process to help alleviate that situation. But all of those things cost time and money, and they've got to you know make sure that they're always being calibrated and tested to make sure they're functioning as pro in a proper fashion. So that is a true statement that, that there are companies out there looking into how we automate that and add some instrumentation and automation to our, our process operation. Anything to add to that, Jason? Sure, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, over the, the last, uh, well, many years, actually, there's there's a constant driver to automate as much as possible um, if, if we go back to uh, Pigpen from that slide, you know, to keep people out of the out of the clean rooms as much as possible um, has always been a driver. And so, the more we can automate on our on our manufacturing lines, uh, the better, because we reduce the load on the clean rooms and therefore the um, potential impact to the products. So, you know, I think this is just another driver that's going to push us more towards automation, which ultimately is a good thing for the industry. All right, thanks. Here's another audience question. It's about green building design. So some of the energy efficient facility designs like variable airflow seem to be a potential disadvantage for trying to keep workers safe from the virus. What are some thoughts on balancing green design and worker safety? I can take that one as a first stab. Uh, that's definitely a tough balance. Tough balancing act basically to look at both those. Um, is what you want to do with energy reduction kind of goes flies in the face of trying to increase airflow and and making sure you've got the right air changes uh, to to flush your facility. Um, so that you know be a problem looking into that. But I think there there are other ways we can look at energy recovery from a different angle. Um, there's other energy recovery systems out there that uh, maybe utilize to help you mitigate that and maybe variable flow down to a certain amount. Maybe that percentage is no longer 50% cutting back in the wintertime. Maybe we've got to go to a higher percentage of your total airflow from a, versus a cooling standpoint, but uh, we may need to implement some other, other ideas there from an energy recovery standpoint. I mean, the other, the other thing, too, with, with added filtration levels that's being talked about in the news, uh, uh, increasing filtration, you know, help uh, in those areas have better filtration uh, from your supply airflow standpoint. That is added pressure drop and increase your energy usage. All of this is a tough balancing act, and it's all got to be looked at. But uh, I think what we were able to achieve from an energy standpoint, uh, it's going to be challenged moving. Forward. I would agree with that. There's there's a number of things that we can do from a sustainable uh, standpoint without impacting the safety of our operators or even the safety of the products that we're making. Um, and certainly, as we do assessments on facilities, you know, we, although we do have to challenge um, some of those critical areas, there is a point where, you know, obviously safety has to be paramount. So, you know, there are other things that we can focus on. Um, uh, certainly, when it when it comes to energy efficiency and reducing heat load, or um, or trying to deal with excessive heat within the facility, because those are some of the the greater um, energy. Um, aspects or users of the facility, but we can do things like looking at secondary and tertiary um, systems for um, for heat exchangers um, to try and re reduce some of the load using cooling towers to reduce initial um, or to provide initial quenching um, so we're not putting as much load on our chillers and, and other aspects. There are a lot of things available to look at without sacrificing 
requirements for safety, um, both for people and the products. All right, we're, we're starting to run out of time, so I'm going to have one question for each expert. So I'm going to be looking for your elevator pitch on this. So, uh, Curtis, uh, so what are some of the best practices or lessons learned from those who say they're ready? Practices that say they're ready? I, I would say uh, can increase from an HVAC perspective, from my background anyway, airflow. Um, in your areas where you know you've got risk is definitely implemented. I think one thing that we've seen is just even shifting supplier around to where the users that are operating uh, in, an, uh, in a clean environment, um, getting that airflow directly over them has improvement. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, Jason, this is uh, for you. So what does the industry need to do to move fast? So in order to move quickly within our, our industry, so we, we, we design and we build very complex facilities. And although it does take a village to de deliver these complex projects, um, one ingredient that I've seen in su successful fast-moving projects is what I would call a project champion, someone on the owner side who has the courage to make timely decisions based on the information on, at hand and who is also able to see the project all the way through. Someone that has an understand, you know, a good understanding of what it really takes and what it really costs and can drive the project forward. And I think, you know, really to move fast, you need that project champion, um, someone that's really going to drive and uh, and get you to the finish line. All right, well, thank you very much. Um unfortunately, we are out of time. The editors would like to extend our thanks to uh, Kurt Firestein of CRB and Jason Collins of IPS for providing their expert insight today. We'd like to thank the audience for attending and participating in this event, and thank our sponsors, Contech, DuPont, ILC, Dover, for making today's webcast possible. You'll receive an email alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. I invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So thank you again for joining us and have a good day.